we actually came back the next day. I came back and, and uh, we had generators and different things, but it was different this time. I started getting text messages from people by Tuesday and Wednesday. Pastor, we've heard the reports. It's really radical. We're in North Carolina. We're going to stay. Pastor, we're over in Dallas. We're some family and friends. We've got to get the kids in school. We've enrolled them here. And I'm thinking, wait, time out. You're part of that 3245. You've got to come back. <laughs> Pastor, we're over in Houston. And, and uh, man, we've got to get the kids in school. And they said it could be weeks or months. And, and, so, and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. The whole church can't leave. I've got to go back. Time out. We've got mortgages to pay. Hang on, this is before online giving. This is before, there's no mail coming in. We've got payments to pay. We've got employees. And, and I'm thinking to myself, man, what am I going to do? My own house, we had our roof and trees and different things. And I'm thinking to myself, man, how, how am I going to respond? To see, see, here's the deal. One of the things you guys often forget, Pastor Stovall, anointed of God, called of God, but he's still a man and he still deals with things in life. Is as anointed as pastors are and great and all that and godly. And at the same time, the, the grappling with the reality of pressure. And I, I went through a spiritual moment called warfare. All these thoughts come into my, li- my mind. And then I talked to a friend, a good friend of mine. Here's what he told me. Good friend of mine. I need some faith. <laughs> I need some hope. And you know what he tells me? He goes, a, good fr- a preacher. He goes, you know what, Steve? You're 35 years old, man. This would be a great time. Nobody would blame you. Move to new this new city and start over. I'm thinking to myself, wow. And I, I learned some things back then. I, I learned some things back then. The issue is not if. The issue is when you go through times of uncertainty and pressure, how do you respond? Again, if you are here, maybe you're a guest. Here, we're so grateful that you're here. Maybe you're new to Christianity or checking it out. See, the Bible is so practical. The Bible is designed by God as a blueprint, a manual for living. And so we're grateful that you're here. And I want to talk to you today about a story in the Bible where a whole, listen, not an individual, but a whole group of people faced a moment of uncertainty, and yet God gave them a way out. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. And we want to look at the children of Israel, the children of Israel, and and how it is, again, many of you know the story In Exodus chapter 14, the children of Israel had gone through the ten plagues, Moses encountering Pharaoh, and finally after the tenth and final plague, you know, Pharaoh let the children of Israel go. They left Egypt. They were going to what's called Canaan land, the place, uh, of course, now modern-day Israel, basically in that area, and they were in Egypt, and they were going up. They had to go through the desert. When they, the, the reality is, though, they were, they were released from Pharaoh, but Pharaoh had a change of heart. Pharaoh had a hardness of heart. So we pick up in the story. It's a very interesting story. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 9, where, where the children of Israel, watch this, they come to a roadblock called the Red Sea. The problem is not just the Red Sea. The problem is behind them, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and now Pharaoh and his army is coming. So the squeeze is coming on. Everybody say pressure. Okay, now watch the pressure, and let's see what God says. Exodus chapter 14, verse 9. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and the chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping. So here it is, the children of Israel, they're hanging out. They're trying to get a plan on what to do because there's, there's an obstacle in front of them, but they hear hoofbeats behind them. And when they turn around, they're like, whoa, whoa. Whoa, what what happened? God, and can you imagine what, listen, can you imagine what went through their mind? God, I thought you delivered me. Lord, where, where are these enemies coming from? God, I thought you spoke to me and you delivered us. God, I thought it was you that put in my heart to start a church, and surely you wouldn't destroy the church we didn't have church for one month. When we had church a month later, we had 1,350 people. That's it. That's that's it took us a whole year just to get back to 2,500 people. All those thoughts. God, I mean, what's up? God, did you not put in my heart to start a church? Was this all just to, that's how some of you guys felt in a marriage. You're Christians and you love God and you're excited about the Lord and then something happens in a relationship. Some of you are here this morning at the campuses. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And you were on a course, and you were so excited, and then, and then the relationship took a turn. 
And you go back and you evaluate at that point. But God, I know this was you. Can you imagine the Israelites? Can you imagine them? God, I thought we got a get out of jail card free. And now the very people you delivered us from. Let's watch what comes out of their mouth. By the way, when you're under pressure, watch what comes out of your mouth. I want to just say a couple things because I think sometimes we don't qualify as preachers. I know pastor does, but man, I watch some guys on TV and I'm like, man, they're great preachers, but let's qualify because what is left unsaid is often said. So I want to communicate. You may be here today and you may be under pressure. Let me tell you, there's always three, one of three reasons why you're under pressure. Number one, it could be because of a choice that you made. You made a foolish choice. We all make foolish choices. And when we make foolish choices, we, we can get into, we can, we can, we, I remember one time, my, my wife was pregnant for our first child. She came in and, and uh, she'd gained some weight. And I said, honey, wow, you've gained some weight. Okay, that's called dumb. It was called cold that night on the couch. Come on, can I have it? There was no love in the house after that. Okay, so sometimes, number one on your notes, sometimes we do things that are unwise. And let me give you the second reason why you might be under pressure today. Not because of your choice, but because of somebody else's choice. Hey, we tie our boats up to others, and sometimes the tide goes up and down, and sometimes other people's. Some of you are in business situations. The fact of the matter is, in America in 2008, when the recession started, I mean, unless you were one of the Wall Street guys that dealt with some of the foolish presumption on the financing side. and so, Look, the reality is all of us suffered because of other people's choices. And sometimes you're in life, it's not because of your choice. You've lived according to the word, but, but we are not exempt we are not exempt from the fallout in the earth from other people's choices as well. Well, sometimes it's not your choice. And sometimes it's not somebody else's choice. But sometimes you're in a situation, I want everybody to hear me, because God led you there to build his character on the inside of you. The reality is, listen, the reality is God has a massive plan for you, so he wants to work in you. God loves you so much, he doesn't want you to be destroyed when that very thing that you're believing for comes to pass. The fact of the matter is the children of Israel, they weren't in this situation because of sin. I hate when people come up, well, you know, there must be some secret sin. What happened to God building character and allowing certain things? Are y'all with me? I'm talking about just pressure. I'm talking about things in our lives. I'm talking about there's pressure moments in our lives. The children of Israel had done nothing wrong, but God had a bigger plan. Come on, are y'all with me? God had a bigger plan. Pressure in the behind and pressure in front. Look at the next verse here. Exodus chapter 10, 14, verse 10. I'm just going to go through this story. Exodus 14, 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So, so, so the first thing that needs to come out of our mouths when we're under pressure is, number one, prayer, crying out to God. Not crying about our problems, but crying out to God. Our help comes from who? Say it. God. It comes from the Lord. But watch what happens. See, here's the challenge. When pressure doesn't ease, the longer you're under pressure, there's something about your mouth and your mindset where now in one moment your hands can be crying out to God. The next moment, if pressure doesn't ease, your fist can be going, God, why me? Be careful of that. Look at, look at these next verses. Then they said to Moses, because there was no graves in Egypt, verse 11, have you taken us here to die? They start murmuring. They start complaining. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. God, I'll never forget. I was at a, 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 a meeting, a church growth meeting, uh, a year after that. Again, our church, you've got to realize, 3,200 people in five years. We lose 2,000 people. Now we're trying to get back. And uh, you have know, all these people, you know, they're starting all these great churches, you know, the fastest growing church in America. We were, by the way, the fastest growing, but backwards in America. It was the fastest decreasing church. We made a list. I know it's out there. I hadn't seen it, but it's there. And I, I remember hearing one guy, you know, we're going, we're so excited. And things are happening. And, and, uh, and I, I said this, and I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed that I said it. But I, I remember thinking to myself, God, why, why wouldn't you put me in a city like that? God, why, why couldn't I be in Dallas? I mean, Dallas. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to go to Dallas? Everybody's wonderful in Dallas. Remember one time there was a hurricane kind of coming up through Houston. I'm like, just hit Dallas. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Everything's, everybody's so pretty in Dallas. And uh, can I just, can I, come on, I'm just getting open and honest today. And I, and I just remember that. Because here's the deal. 
I got to deal with it every year. It's not a one-time deal. I got to deal with it in August. We're building a 30-something million dollar building. I'm thinking to myself, before God, I'm like, God, <laughs> it's your deal. And if this thing comes through here and destroys it, I'm going to ask Stovall for a job as a youth pastor. Come on, I don't, I don't know what else to do. With this. Somebody else go worry about that big old dumb building. I mean, I, <laughs> so, so what I'm, I'm not talking about theory that something that happened when I was six and I was locked in a refrigerator and now I got fr brain freeze dry. I'm talking about every single year I got to deal with this. Talking about murmuring and complaining. Um, speaking of a, a monastery, you know, you go to a monastery, guys take vows of silence. So this guy goes in this monastery, and the superiors tell him, he says, you can only say two words every seven years. Comes up to his superiors, and he goes, cold floors. Away. Seven years later, he comes back, and he goes, bad food. Away. Seven years later, he comes up, and he goes, I quit. <laughs> Look, so the elder said, doesn't surprise us you've done nothing but complain ever since you've been here. Come on, anybody ever, <laughs> anybody ever felt like that before? Wow. Here's what I want to do in my remaining time. I got 13 minutes and 57, 56. I'm buying that clock in Jesus' name. Right. I'm just joking. <laughs> Listen. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask everybody in their Bibles. I'm going to give you something that God gave me. Matter of fact, I did a series called Uncertain on this topic, preaching to myself. How many know sometimes you just need to preach to yourself? You just, I, look, you just need to preach it to yourself. God showed me in this store there are four things. I'm telling you, those of you on, in uncertainty right now, those of you in pressure, relationships, economically, in your health, your job, these four things, number one, watch this, Exodus chapter 14, verse 13 to 15. I want you guys to follow along. It's right there in the Word. And Moses said to the people, so here's the antidote. They can't go forward right now in this situation without their faith. They, 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 let me say this, it's perceived that they can't go forward. And I'm going to talk about that at the last point. It looks like they can't go forward. They definitely can't go backward. What do they do? And Moses said to the people, number one, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. Isn't that good news? How many of y'all want God fighting your battles? The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your what? Say it. Peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. In essence, I believe that God gives us, watch this, a template of how to deal with pressure. Not if you do it, but when you deal with pressure in the word, I think there's four things. All right, I want to go through it. Number one, everybody say, fear not. The children of Israel were right where God led them. They were right smack dab in the middle of the will of God. And all of a sudden, they realize that they are trapped. Look, the first thing that the enemy does and he hits you in uncertain times, the first time you get the, a report from the doctor, the first time, look, you get the report about the business situation, or the first time somebody comes to you and says something to you about, man, the relationship thing's not working out, or the school calls you because your kid is acting up or something, the first strategy of the enemy is to, boom, hit you with fear. And let me tell you, fear is not just an attitude, a, me a, a mental attitude. It is also a spiritual force. It is a, there is a real spiritual battle that we're in as believers. So what happens is if the enemy right there, boom, can hit you with fear, knock you off course, quit coming to church, God, where are you? What happened? Quit serving the Lord, quit serving in ministry, quit giving to God. Why? Man, God, what's going on? I thought you'd deliver me. How could this be happening? All those thoughts go through our mind. The number one thing that we have to recognize is that there is a psychological, spiritual warfare designed strategically from the enemy to take you out of the race, and it comes through fear. Fear. 